Hello everyone, welcome to the second part in the trauma-informed care for counselors. Uh, this is a series where we are explaining the different parts on how to be uh, competent in trauma-informed care um, as a counselor. So the first part looked at trauma-informed screening and how to do it effectively, what to look for and what to carry forward from it. Today's video is going to look at creating a safe relationship with your client, the neurobiology of trauma, as well as grounding techniques. Uh, for your client. The way that we do these videos is that I will provide to you the information you need to know as a counselor as well as how to translate that into a conversation with a client. So the first thing we're going to go through today is creating a safe relationship with your client. This is important in every single type of care, um, establishing that therapeutic alliance is paramount. Uh, it's even more so in um, client relationships that have experienced trauma as they may have a lack of feeling safe, they may not feel like they're in control, and they may need um, more safe environment building in order to make them feel like they can trust you and that you can do work with them. So ensuring your client's safety is your number one priority. You want to make sure that when they're coming into your office, you're asking them, is there something I can do to make you feel more comfortable? Do you feel safe here? Um, and always striving to ensure that you are giving them your undivided attention, that you are non-judgmental, that you are listening, that you are caring, and that you have their best interests in mind. So if your client does disclose something to you, the way in which that you should respond to this is that you should always believe them. Take everything that they say and accept it. Um, it's not your job to ask questions, press for details, your job is to be there and listen to them. And so you want to validate what they're telling you and you want to go ahead and pull out strengths. So acknowledge the fact that it was extremely difficult to go through it the first time and that through going through it a second time today through explaining it to you is a difficult process and that you are honored that they could feel uh, comfortable enough to tell you that. And as I mentioned, you want to give them their full attention. You don't want to cut them off at all if they're doing a disclosure. You don't want to make them feel uncomfortable or not listened to in any way, shape, or form because that completely damages the therapeutic alliance and sometimes it's irreparable. If you do need to ask a question or um, press for important information, um, always preface it by saying something to the effect of you're in control, you can choose not to answer, um, or if you don't feel comfortable doing so, we can just move on after this. It's up to you. You're the ringleader here. Um, you can also give them the option if your client is nonverbal, if they don't feel safe disclosing information verbally, or if they feel like they're lis being listened to, um, you can give them the option to shake their head uh, yes and no. And so you can say something to the effect of, I'm just going to ask you a question right now. Is that okay? You can shake your head yes or uh, shake your head no. And then they will do that as a result and it's a nice way to establish control and put things into perspective for your client. One of the really important parts of creating a safe relationship with your client is normalizing. Normalizing what they're currently feeling as a result of what they went through. So saying that what you're feeling is normal. To have decreased sleep or increased startle response is a normal reaction to this abnormal situation that you went through. The brain that we have likes to be balanced. Big fancy word for you guys as counselors, homeostasis or equilibrium. So it likes to be at this point. And when someone has experienced trauma, it tips out of balance. And that's when we see those trauma symptoms because there's a discrepancy here and the brain is not balanced. When you're explaining this to a client, you can say to them, you went through with trauma and trauma does have an impact on the brain. And so that's why you're feeling the things that you're feeling right now. But the change that will happen in your brain it's not permanent and we can reverse some of that change and we can help you to feel better through therapy and through uh, different approaches towards healing. And so you can also include in the situation if they're feeling guilt over becoming immobilized in the situation that they were in or if they feel like they should have fought back, you can talk to them about the responses to trauma being the three Fs, fight, flight, and freeze, and that freeze is something that our body does in order to protect us and to ensure our survival and so that that was a completely normal reaction given the situation that they were in. So moving into the neurobiology part, this part's going to be a little bit heavier, so I'm going to give you the information that you need to know as a counselor 
and then also give you how you can describe it to a client. So we'll start with what you need to know first. When exp explaining the neurobiology of trauma to clients, you want to do it in a uh, way that's easily understood and the language is approachable. So don't take what I'm saying directly right now and use it. Wait for the second part for that. So always use an EPE approach. So elicit from them what they already know about it. So can you tell me what you know about trauma in the brain? Moving into, okay, so it sounds like you have a lot, sounds like you have a little, tailoring it around, however it may be, and then providing the information to fill in the gaps. So the four brain parts that we're going to be talking about today are the frontal lobes, the hippocampus, the thalamus, and the amygdala. So these big fancy words, we're not going to call them that when we talk to a client. For the time being though, we're going to talk about the four brain structures. So the amygdala, this is a little part in your limbic system, middle of your brain, that is responsible for detecting threat and then um, preparing the body for a response to that threat. So in a person without trauma, it will recognize the threat as necessary and then uh, begin to prepare the hormones in the body like cortisol to get the body moving and out of the um, situation. So for example, if an individual is swimming in the ocean and they see a shadow beneath them, their amygdala might say, hey, that's a shark, we're going to swim away from it. That would be the amygdala's job to recognize threat. However, in someone who's experienced trauma, instead of responding to um, only threats, it perceives everything as a threat. And so as a result, it is constantly active. And so we like to refer to this as the smoke detector and that the smoke detector is constantly going off. So it, this can kind of manifest itself in the symptoms of an increased startle response or hypervigilance or difficulty sleeping. And so that's how the amygdala is affected. The hippocampus, which is another midbrain structure, is responsible for memory. And so in those who haven't experienced trauma, it is something that it's going to take memories, it's consolidating them, and it's going to organize them um, appropriately. However, in someone who has experienced trauma, the hippocampus itself shrinks. And the shrinkage of the hippocampus results in memory difficulties, um, problems learning new information, as well as problems, problems, sorry, difficulty problem solving, especially under stressful situations. The third brain structure is the thalamus. This is sometimes referred to as the cook. So the thalamus is responsible for taking all of the sensory information from our environment and going through it. It filters through and it says, this is relevant, this is irrelevant, this is important, this is not important. I think that this should go to another brain structure or this should go to the emotional brain, whatever it may be. So without trauma, it does a really good job of deciding what needs to go to our frontal lobes for higher processing and what needs to go directly to the amygdala because it's a threat. Once we've experienced trauma, it's this cook has a difficulty distinguishing where things need to go and there's no specific filter. And so as a result, it's sensory overload because it's just sending everything to the amygdala because it doesn't know what's relevant, what's not relevant, and what's a threat and what's not. And then the frontal lobes, this part of your brain here, is responsible for higher thinking. Um, a lot of logic and reasoning comes from this section of the brain. And so those without trauma, um, they can accurately assess the situation, logically reason this is not a threat, wasn't actually a shark swimming beneath me, it was just a man on a boogie board, I'm okay. Um, and then it can also, if the amygdala starts to act up, it can be like, no, no, we can quiet down, it's not a big deal, it's all right. And it has that kind of control. However, in someone with trauma, the three structures previously mentioned, the hippocampus, the thalamus, and the amygdala, override the uh, frontal lobes here and the logic gets turned off. And so in a result, we call this the hijacking of the um, logical brain by the emotional brain. So emotional brain's right in here, logic brain's here, and these three structures basically cause this to go offline and they become in control. At this point, you can ask the client, did I lose you anywhere? Is this making sense to you? Um, and kind of trying to elicit from them how this makes them feel or does this help them see their situation differently in any way. However, as I mentioned, that's a lot of fancy language. It's not necessary. So what we've got here is the four structures that I talked about. And so what we're going to look at is what we call them and a way to explain it to the client. So we're going to start with the thalamus just down here, the cook. So the thalamus 
for the cook is, as we said, the cook is responsible for filtering the information that comes in. When someone has experienced trauma, their ability to filter things effectively becomes uh, lowered or diminished, and as a result, they get sensory overload. So the cook is having a decreased ability to do his job. For the amygdala, as we mentioned, we're going to call it the smoke alarm. So our cook, decreased ability. Our smoke alarm, it's overactive. The individual's smoke alarm is constantly going off and detecting everything as a threat. As a result, we've got an increase in the smoke alarm. The frontal lobes, the watchtower, the lifeguard, the person who's looking over everything. Their ability to accurately assess everything is an issue and they become overstimulated. Overstimulation in this region resulted in overstimulation in this region. And then the filing cabinet or the hippocampus becomes decreased and is unable to do its memory as well. So when explaining it to a client, you can simply say, you've got four brain regions that are impacted by trauma. You have a part of your brain that's responsible for sorting through and filtering information. We can call this guy the cook. Once you've experienced trauma, he's unable to do that as effectively as he'd like to. And as a result, you have sensory overload. You have a part of your brain that is the smoke detector and it's gonna sense threat. With trauma, it does a great job of deciding what is and what isn't a threat, sorry, without trauma. And then with trauma, it can't do that anymore and it decides everything is a threat. The filing cabinet is responsible for storing your memories. Without trauma, it can do that no problem. And with trauma, you have difficulty forming new memories, learning and um, problem solving, especially in stressful, stressful situations. <laughs> And then for the lifeguard here, he, he's at the front of your brain, he's watching over everything you do. And without trauma, he does a great job of assessing if there's a threat or not and what to do accordingly. However, with uh, once you've experienced trauma, it becomes an issue and he sees everything as kind of being threat and sending it straight to that smoke detector to start blaring. And again, at the end of that, you wanna ask the client, does that make sense to you? Did I lose you anywhere? Um, and you can even do that after each section. So you can tell them about the cook and then say, does that make sense? Or how do you think this provides a, a, is attributed to your situation? And then you can go into the smoke alarm and say, does that make sense? Can you think of how that applies to your situation? And really making sure that they are seeing the connection between their brain and their body and what they're feeling and what they're thinking. And so, Another thing you can do if they're more visual is that you can show them a picture of what the brain looks like. So for example, something like this. And so this just shows the different parts of the brain and you can just say the relevant parts so they can visually see like that's the cook right there, the thalamus. Or that right there is the smoke detector. Or this front part of the brain there is the lifeguard and so on. So the last part of this instructional video is the grounding techniques. So grounding techniques are basically anything that takes the individual out of their current trauma loop. And so when providing a client with a grounding technique, we don't want to just give one. We want to give them more than one. And this is because they might not like all the ones that we give them and they might want more in their tool belt or one thing that normally works for them might not work in a given situation and we need to have them readily available so that the client can use a backup technique. And so same thing as when we were doing the neurobiology, we wanna follow an EPE approach. So you can ask the client, can you tell me what you know about grounding skills? And they might say they know a lot, they might say they know a little and you should tailor your response in the provide section accordingly. But moving into telling them, would it be okay if I told you a little bit about that, giving them that control, and they might say, yeah, that's okay. And you can say, great. So a grounding technique is something that takes you out of your current situation and gets you focused on the present moment. Um, and it helps to reduce some of those trauma symptoms. It won't make them go away entirely, but it ideally is enough that they can get them out of that situation. Um, it wants it to be present focused external to the body and an active process can't just be something that they're doing on the back burner in their mind. There's three different types. There's mental, physical, and soothing. 
So mental grounding is something that's done in the mind and it's supposed to distract from thoughts um, that are causing trauma symptoms. So one of the things that you can do is categorization. And so when you run this with a client, you would say, is it okay if I run this with you right now? And they might say yes, and you say, great. So what I'm gonna get you to do is I'm gonna get you to begin by naming as many TV shows that are in the genre of comedy as you can. They might say The Office, Brooklyn Nine-Nine, Friends, Seinfeld. And when you notice them starting to lose traction, you can ask another thing. Can you get me to tell me all of the movies that you know that are sci-fi or all the songs that are country? And you can get them to do this categorization task that allows them to be fully present and thinking in the next thing in this list and it might distract them from the symptoms that they're feeling. The second thing is physical and this is using the physical senses um, to be aware of the present moment. And so the most common one is the 54321 and it's based on your senses and it can go in any which order. My preferred order is five things you see, four things you touch, three things you hear, two things you smell and one thing you taste. But the individual can um, vary them up accordingly. So for example, if they're on a walk, they might hear a lot more than they uh, taste. But if they're at a restaurant, they might taste a lot more than they smell, for example. And so you would run it through with the client by saying, okay, I'm just gonna get you to say five things that you can see right now from where you are. And I might say, I can see aloe vera, a camera, um, a, another plant, a laptop, and then you can say, okay, can you tell me four things that you can touch from where you are? And if they're at a grocery store, they might say the candy bars or the milk or my shopping cart. And it's just something to get them focused outside of the situation on like, this is directly in front of me. I can feel this. I can taste this, etc. And so for soothing grounding techniques, this is kind of more self-talk that is very positive, kind, and calm. So the way that you would address this is almost like making a mantra for yourself and it's something that you can tell yourself when you're starting to experience these trauma symptoms. So you might say, I'm strong, I'm in control and I can do this. Or I'm brave, I've done this before, I can do it again. And it's something that they can repeat to themselves and this is gonna be very individualized. What works for one person will not work for another person. And so encouraging your client to uh, discover what does work for them is extremely important. And again, checking in with them after each one of these ones that you run, seeing how it felt for them, did it work for them, um, and then checking in at the very end and saying, does this help you uh, change your situation or do you think that you could use this going forward? And for example, if they say they really liked the mental one, you could give them more mental grounding techniques to take home with them if that was the one that resonated with them the most. When you as a counselor are conducting a grounding technique with your client, make sure that you are calm and that you are uh, relaxed. Because if you are stressed and if you are anxious, if your voice is very rapid or very loud, um, it makes the activity seem less approachable, um, less doable by the client and a little bit more uncomfortable. And you want them to be comfortable and safe. And this is one of the ways that we can uh, continue to maintain that safe relationship and the most important thing with grounding techniques is never recommend something that you wouldn't do yourself or you haven't already tried yourself because it makes you come off as ingenuine, which can damage your therapeutic alliance. And it's also very apparent to the client that you're just pushing an agenda, which is detrimental to that safe relationship. So with grounding techniques, only recommend the ones that you enjoy or that you know work or that you've tried yourself because the client isn't coming to you to just be pushed around they're coming to you to create that relationship and to be helped that's everything that we had on this session today so thank you for tuning in